All right, so I got a microphone I got to turn on here. So tonight I want to bring you a message from uh, the book of Jonah. But before I do, I just want to take some time to acknowledge our teen group and the uh, appreciation I have to lead them. Uh, it's a mature group of uh, kids, and, and uh, we're blessed to be able to lead them in, in their walk with the Lord. I appreciate Pastor and Caleb with their guidance and, um, and helping us find our way through this as it's new for us, um, and that's a big responsibility. But, um, but God knows, and God's been good to us, and uh, I thank you all for coming. If you're visiting, I appreciate it. Um, I appreciate your support personally, and, and uh, so as we talk tonight, I want to talk about the power of perspective. Uh, when we look at the book of Jonah, you're going to find that you could substitute your name in his place. Uh, throughout the book, you could say, um, you know, Nathan ran from the Lord, or, or uh, you know, Nathan uh, was in the belly of a fish, and and we're going to talk a little bit about that, and so I'd like you to um, consider that as we, as we continue throughout the service. But perspective plays a big part in your life, and what I'm, going to, what I'm going to talk about is I want you to consider what perspective do I view the world? And so when you talk about the, how you view the world, you're talking about your attitude, you're talking about your opinions of things, um, you're talking about the explanation of circumstances that happen to you and around you and to your family and to your friends. And um, I hope that tonight you'll see that the perspective that we are born into, the perspective that most of us have, well, all of us have from time to time, whether you're a Christian or not, um, I still struggle with these things. And so tonight we're going to talk about perspective. Um, for example, if the President of the United States makes a ruling or um, raises my taxes, I may see that in my world, in a close-up view, a small, a small world, my little bubble, I may see that and complain about, I don't want to pay taxes, that's going to take food off my table, etc. Right? But the president's in charge of the United States. He's making decisions for everyone, and not just for me. Um, to bring it a little bit closer home, we talk about with pastor, or I talk with pastor about this. Pastor may make a decision that affects somebody in the church, or some of us in the church. Um, he, just changed, he just changed the time for the service not that long ago, and some of us were like, I gotta get up earlier? I gotta be here 15 minutes early? Are you kidding me? But pastor has an idea of what's going on in the church, he is trying to meet the needs of the church, and he knows things that we do not. And so as pastor leads this church, um, he is making decisions. But in my world, in my perspective, the things that I see and the things that matter to me matter to me because I care about me. And so when I, see, when I make a decision or my attitude toward, towards pastor or the president or whoever it may be, it's because I'm looking at it from a perspective where I'm the center of this universe. And so tonight I want to challenge you with, with thinking, is that my perspective? And is it healthy? And so um, as we go into the book of Jonah, before we visit the word, I'd just like to open in some prayer. Lord God, I thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. I pray, Lord, that your word and its message will reach the hearts of those that are here today. I pray, Lord, that you won't allow me to get into the way as a messenger and that uh, your word will speak for itself. Lord, I thank you for those that made it a priority to be here tonight. And I pray that uh, you will speak to them individually and meet their needs this evening. I pray for those that are preparing the Thanksgiving feast down below. I, I thank you for their willingness to serve so that we can have it. I pray you'll bless that food. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless this message and give us safety to return home. In your name, amen. All right, so up on the screen, you're going to see a picture, albeit it's kind of dark. It's a little bit lighter on my laptop, but you can see it nonetheless. And on the left, you're going to see it's basically just a blown up portion of the picture on the right. Everybody sees that? I want you to, to look at that and understand that when I'm talking about perspective, this is exactly what I'm talking about. We live on the left. We live in our little world where we're looking at the middle. We're looking at that little piece of something. 
right? You could think of it as a puzzle or anything else, but for the purpose of this message, I picked this design. And I want you to think about this picture as we go through the message. You see, the picture on the left is beautiful in and of itself. It's detailed. Um, it's desirable to look at. And a lot of times, that's my life. And a lot of times, I live on that, that left picture, and I think that that's sufficient, and that I'm sufficient in myself, and that the only things that I'm concerned with are those things, is that picture and the beautiful design within. What we're missing a lot of the time and what you're going to see with Jonah's life as he, um, just a snapshot of his, his uh, narrative in, this chap in these four chapters, you're going to see Jonah was this way too. God called him to do something and he couldn't get out of his own head because he was looking at himself. And so the picture on the right, we're going to talk a little bit more about later in the service, but that's the whole picture. Right? So this is obviously a stained glass of a famous cathedral in Europe somewhere. And I wouldn't be able to pronounce it if I had it in front of me. But the, the picture on the right, the bigger picture, is much more beautiful, much more detailed, much more intrinsic. There's much more to it. And so as we look at Jonah, you're going to see that the picture on the right is God's plan for Jonah. The picture on the left was Jonah's plan for Jonah. And you're going to see that if you submit yourselves to God and to his plan, God has a whole lot more in store for you than what you think is beautiful to yourself. So your perspective is established, um, establishes your reference point on the way you view the world. And that comes out in your attitude, forming your opinions, and explaining your circumstances. This is a, one I threw in there I had to because of pastor. Pastor's our marathon runner. Uh, he runs these marathons, as does his wife. And again, we're looking at, this would definitely shape your attitude, opinion, and explain your circumstances if you're, on the, if you're on the left here and you're looking at a mass of people, probably somewhere towards the beginning, middle of the race, and right after you got done hearing the starting pistol go off, you're into the race and you're feeling pretty good, but then you look ahead and you said, why did I sign up for this again? I'm hurting. I don't want to do it. I'm nervous, the end is so far, it's 26 miles away, or 20 miles away, or 15 miles away, and there's no end in sight. And your mind's not fixed on the bigger picture, is it? It's now starting to close in around you, and you're seeing that little perspective of what is concerning with Nathan, what's concerning with, with me, what is my life, what are the hurts, what are the pains, what are the sufferings of my life right now, right here and now, in my little bubble, and I'm not concerned about anything else. And you may want to quit. And there's times in the race, so I'm sure the pastor could attest to you, there are people that drop out and quit. And there are people that just say, this isn't worth it, it's too hard. And they quit. Because they're not seeing the big picture. And what's part of that big picture is the finish line. And so when you look at the right, when you see that, all of a sudden you don't feel the pain anymore. All of a sudden you get a little boost. All of a sudden you're starting to close in and pick up your speed a little bit because you've done it. You've completed it. Your eye is on the prize and you're focused. And so as we look at Jonah tonight, I want you to be thinking about some of these pictures, and I want you to ask yourself, is my perspective a small picture perspective that's, that's focused around me and my circumstances? Or is it a big picture of what God's plan is for me if I would tap in and accept his calling? So as we move forward, I want you to um, turn back in your Bible with me as we look at the Word of God. So pastors doing and or just finished up Jeremiah in Sunday morning. And so we were on chapter 50 today. He did it in about four or five weeks. And so I think I can do four chapters in one night. So we are going to um, not pick verse by verse, but I'm going to give you the cliff note version of it. And those that are familiar with Jonah, this will be a refresher to you. Those that are not, um, this will be an introduction. But nonetheless, you'll get the meat. So if we can turn to our Bible, um, Jonah 1.1. 1, 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. And let's stop there for a moment. Actually, before I explain, flip in your Bible a few pages to the right, probably four or five pages, you're going to come to Nahum, Nahum chapter 3. And while you're turning there, I'll kind of tell you what we're going to be talking about. So Nineveh is where Jonah was asked to go. 
And God said, Arise, go to Nineveh, and tell them that they're a wicked people and I'm going to destroy them, is what he's saying. So Nineveh, in Nahum chapter 3, is described. Picking up in verse 1, Woe to the bloody city! It is full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. The noise of a whip and the noise of a rattling of the wheels and of the prancing horses and the jumping chariots. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses. And there is none end to their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. And you can go back to, to Jonah now. But as we talk about Nineveh, I want you to get a picture of what Nineveh is. Nineveh is a great city. Um, we're not just talking about some story in the Bible. We're talking about historical facts now. We, are, we often, as Christians, get sidetracked with stories in the Bible. And our teen group has been talking about this. When you take the Word of God and you've accepted God as creator of the world, you have to accept the, the Bible as factual and historical. And it's an historical account of things that have happened. And no longer are you looking at them as stories in the Bible and just good moral lessons for us to learn from. So if you're looking at it from a biblical perspective and you look at it being historical, you'll know that Nineveh is a city that's probably a little shy of a million people. It's massive. It takes three days to journey through it. And they were wicked. And so the Ninevites... To describe them, if you look at our current culture and our terrorist groups that are in this world and you see all the awful things that they do, Nineveh makes them look like a gang from West Side Story, right? Snapping their fingers, the sharks and the jets, right? Nineveh was bad. Nineveh was wicked and God had had enough. And so God had called his servant Jonah to go to Nineveh and tell him that they're wicked. And they need to turn from their wicked ways and accept God. And so, if you haven't accepted God, and you're here today, I want you to t try and figure out, are you a Ninevite? You may not be wicked and um, killing people and doing awful things, but has God ever called, had put somebody in your life to call you to repent and turn to God? And so, throughout this book of Jonah, there's going to be a cast of characters that we can identify with. And you can identify with Jonah, you can identify with some of the shipmen on the boat, or you can identify with the Ninevites. But the whole time, please um, try to examine your life and find out where you are in all of this. As we turn back to Jonah, I want you to look at picking up in verse 4. But the Lord sent out a great, or, uh, I'm sorry, 3. But Jonah rose up to flee from, uh, unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Job. Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. All right, so this is where I say, yep, I'm Jonah. I could be Jonah. I am Jonah in a lot of ways. There are times that God has called on me to do, do, several th to do specific things, and God says go, and I say no, right? And we've all been there. And this is one of those times that Jonah was chosen by God to be a preacher of the, of the Word of God. And he wanted to do it, and he loved it, and he wanted to go preach. But he said, go to Nineveh, and nope, I'm good. And so how many of us are there? How many of us are living in that little perspective of, I don't see God's perspective, I see mine. And it doesn't, it doesn't add up. It doesn't add up to my comfort. I don't want to leave my comfort zone. Think about you in this church. Think about you in your, at home. Are there things that you just don't want to do because it takes you out of your comfort zone? Because it's something you may be scared to do? I mean, quite frankly, in this passage, God is asking Jonah to do a pretty major thing. You know, if he called me tonight to go to Iraq and preach the gospel, I would have a Jonah moment. I can tell you that. Because that's real. And Jonah's real. And Jonah's a real person that has real feelings, that has sin, and struggles with sin, and struggles with what perspective he looks at the world. And that shapes his attitude, that shapes the way he has, views opinions of things, and that shapes the way he views the experiences and circumstances around him. So as we fast forward through Jonah, 
We see that in verse 4, the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so the ship was like to be broken. This is an important verse, and if you underline in your Bibles, I always underline uh, important things to me, and I underline the Lord sent out a great wind. Why is that important? Because it demonstrates in this narrative that God is the one that sent the tempest into Jonah's life. We're going to ask ourselves, well, why did God do that? I thought he loved Jonah. And what's important is how we look at God's intention. What was God's intention of when he sent out this wind? Jonah is rebelling from God. He's running from God. We've all been there. And God's not letting him go. So God sends out the wind. And uh, you can translate that word, I believe, sent into almost throwing. God threw the, the wind towards the ship. He controlled it. And so that shows us that God is sovereign. God is in charge. Fast line through this, and you'll see that the mariners on the ship who are unsaved at the time are freaking out, right? So if you can imagine, you've got experienced people on a boat. They're running this boat, and all of a sudden a, a tempest breaks out. Now these are experienced people on a boat. They're used to storms at sea. And they're not used to this one, though, and they're scared. And they're running around, and they're unsaved, so they're calling upon the God of thunder and the God of lightning and the God of wind and the, the God of boats and the God of wood and the God of whatever else trying to get this thing to stop. And lo and behold, they come across Jonah. And they say, Jonah, we know you're from Israel. Cry out to your God to make this stop. Well, this is an important part of the book because Jonah is still living in that perspective of self. And Jonah, I imagine Jonah as a child was a rascal, right? Rebellious, probably had the last word, probably ran away when you're telling him to do something. And I don't know if you guys know any children like that in this church, but there are a few, right? Little rascals. And that's part of his personality. Don't you think that, that God knew that? God and all-knowing God knew his people. And he knew that Jonah's personality was such that when he told him to do something difficult, he may run. And so when that happened, God used that as a way to reach the lost. And you're going to see throughout this message that God is going to use the suffering in your life and the, the loss in your life and the trials in your life to help grow patience in your life, to bring you closer to God, but also to reach those that don't know him and to use them as a testimony to reach the lost. And so on that ship, there's a, um, they go get Jonah. Long story short, Jonah doesn't want to cry out to God. Instead, he goes, I'm ready to die. Just throw me over. You throw me over, God's mad at me. Throw me over. It'll be over. You guys will be safe, and we'll be good to go. So reluctantly, the shipmen throw Jonah over the, over the ship and into the ocean. Can you imagine this now? If we're talking about this being actual, factual, this happened. All of a sudden, boom, one, two, three, and he's over, and he's sinking down, and he talks about how the seaweed encompassed him. But you'll see in your Bibles, verse 17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So, yes, God created that storm. God threw that storm at the, at the boat. But he also had a bigger plan, did he not? To prepare a fish specifically for Jonah, to swallow him up, to preserve and sustain him through his suffering and through his trial, through his near-death experience. This is, again, talking about God's love and talking about how God chose Jonah for a specific mission to reach others. And so the verse just prior in 16 well, 15, we'll go chapter 1, verse 15. So they look upon Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from their raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. So already, we're not even through the first chapter, and you've got Jonah rebels against God. He runs from God. 
God tracks him down where he's at. Notice God comes to you. He comes to Jonah. He finds you. He tracks him down. And then he prepares a storm that ultimately Jonah gets cast into the, the water and the sea stops. Stops its raging. And what did that do? Nothing minor. It saved a, a few men from an eternity apart from God. And as you move forward, Jonah's in the belly of a fish and he prays to God. And in verse 9, chapter 2, verse 9, he says, But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish and vomited Jonah unto the dry land. Chapter 3, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, the great city, and preach unto it, preaching that I bid thee. All right, so God is not done with Jonah. Jonah did not run from God, and Jonah still has to fulfill the plan that God had in place. And I want you to take special consideration and notice of the fact that, one, when Jonah rebelled God and ran, God could have moved on and raised somebody else up to go preach to Nineveh, but he didn't. Because can I tell you that the Bible tells us that once you are God's, and once you are God's child, he sustains you and holds you in the palm of his hand, and he will not let you go. You cannot run from God, you cannot hide from God, and God will come get you, and he will find you, and he will protect you, and he will use you. And so um, God comes, it's very important that we see, and the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Has the Lord ever come to you a second time after you've told him no? Have you had the opportunity to get to know Jesus and told him, no, I'll do it later? And then another time, and a third time, and a fourth time? Has God called you to read your Bible more, attend church more, reach the lost, become active in service work, and you've told him no? Like Jonah, I've done that several times. And I do it every day. There's ways that I behave, there's, there's my attitude, there's my... my opinions of things, the things I say about people, uh, my overall explanation of what's happening around me in the immediate area, because I'm centered on me. I'm a sinful man. And I often run from God, but God always comes back to me, and he always accepts my, my repentance. So what you're going to see, and what's important, is as we go through chapter 3 real quickly, and we're going to move on. So Jonah arose, verse 3, Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of God. And now Nineveh was exceeding great city of three days' journey, which means it took that long to cover the city. And Jonah began to enter into the city in a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Verse 5, and this is important. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. And so what you, what it doesn't say right there, but what you know if you uh, study some additional um, historical background as well as um, other biblical accounts, you'll see that about a half a million people became saved that day because of a few words that Jonah did, and he did it out of obedience. You see, Jonah ran from God, wanted to die, got thrown into the sea, God saved him from the sea. He spent time in the fish. And when you're in the, in the belly of a fish, I can't imagine that it's, that it's very fun. Jonah describes, as that, describes it as hell, the closest thing to hell. And when he, spit, he prays to God, he gets right with God. And when he gets out of that fish, he takes a step of obedience. And you're going to see throughout the book as we come to the chapter 4, Jonah gets angry that a half a million people got saved. Does that make sense? Are you Jonah? Could you be Jonah? Do you just get angry with God because things that please God don't please you? Because they're inconvenient for you? Because they're out of your comfort zone? Because that's what's going on with Jonah. Jonah, if you remember the picture I put up there, is looking at the small, the small picture. And he's fine with it. He, he is not looking at the big picture. And we're going to talk about how you can look at that big picture. 
You see, Jonah's perspective is small and God's perspective is big. And so you ask yourself, well, if I want to have God's perspective, how do I get that? Well, God's perspective comes after you make that, that step of faith. When you make that step of faith to believe what God says is true and to believe that God is the God of the creation, of all creation, that he controls the tempest and the storms and the suffering and the hurt and the pain in your life, and he's going to use it for good, then you can start to see things from God's perspective. And this is why, and this is important, because God's perspective starts to come into your, your vision when he reveals himself to you. And he won't reveal himself to you until you accept him into your heart. And you start reading the Bible, and you start praying to God, and you build that personal relationship with him, that you start to learn about who God is and what his character is. We read this verse this morning, but Isaiah 55, 7-9 says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and unto our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You see, we don't know what God's perspective is, but by faith and learning of his character, we can rest assured that there is hope and trust in a God that loves us. And so, as we look at the points of application, I want you to think, like Jonah, Christian, God has called you to witness to the lost. When was the last time any of us did that? When was the last time any of us got out of our comfort zone and witnessed and shared the gospel with anybody that we weren't friends with? You know, I challenge our Sunday school and our Wednesday night team group to talk to people outside their comfort zone, to invite them and pray for them and get them to consider turning their life over to God. Because when we witness to the lost, we do it in a lot of different ways on the fringe, but how often do we go up and ask somebody if they actually believe in Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ in Matthew 28, 18 through 20 gave us a command. As the disciples, he spoke to them and he said, And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe things, all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. This is the command from Jesus to us to witness to the lost. God is sovereign in the storms and victories of your life. See, this is a perspective thing, the power of perspective. When storms come into your life and you're disappointed or tried, when disease riddles your body or a loved one passes away, when victories happen, you get job promotion, or a baby's introduced into your life. What perspective are you looking at those things from? Because if you're looking at those things like Jonah did in this narrative, chapters 1 through 4, you're right here. And you're not looking at it from a godly perspective, a biblical perspective. And so those storms, they encompass you. They, they lead you, like Jonah, to the edge of death where you want to just die because you don't want to deal with the suffering anymore. You want to let go because you're in rebellion with God and you don't acknowledge his love for you. Colossians 1, 16-17 says, For by him we were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. You know what this is telling us? It's telling us, like Jonah, I'm in control. I, God, am in control. I have your back if you trust me. These things look terrible. These look like you're at the edge of death and like you want to give up. But with me, there's hope. On your own, there's no hope. Point number three, having a biblical big picture results in an attitude of gratitude. So I had to throw this up here because we're getting close to Thanksgiving. And as we, as we look at uh, an attitude of gratitude, I want to bring up 
James 1, 2, 8, Paul is saying, My brethren, count it all joy, lest he fall into divers temptations. Why would Paul say count it joy to suffer? Have you? Have you ever said that? Paul continues, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Verse 3 is the important one in that. Knowing that this, that trying of your faith worketh patience. Storms in your life that happen, and we're talking about serious things, force you to look at your perspective of how you view them. Do I view them from a me-centric point of view? My reference point is all about me. As Pastor referenced, the trilogy of me, right? Me, myself, and I. Because if that's the case, you're always going to be a complainer. Nothing's ever going to be good enough. You're never going to have um, hope. You're always going to have high anxiety because there's no peace. Philippians 4, 4 through 7 tells us, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Be in prayers and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God in the peace of God. And get this, which passeth all understanding shall keep you hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Closing thoughts. You can close your Bibles. As we look at Jonah and we look at his perspective, Jonah was a man of God, chosen by God, to fulfill a plan of God. And, go, and Jonah rebelled, much like you and I on a daily basis. I hear our teens say they struggle with things. They come back from the wilds and they're on a wild tie. I'm living my life for God. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I'm changing this. That's out of my life. And then all of a sudden it's back to kind of where they were before. And that's not anything against them. That's because we're human beings. And that we are struggling with a life of sin. And like Jonah, if you've given your life to God, then you have a God that loves you enough to come after you. And you have a God that has put trials in your life to draw you closer to Him. I asked you at the beginning to consider the question, from what perspective do I view the world? I want you to keep that for the next two minutes while I finish up. As I look around the room, I know for a fact, because I know you, that there are some people really hurting out there. There's a lot of pain and there's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of people who have thought about dying as an option, right? I've just, I can't take it anymore. God save me from this. And it's quiet. There's a lot of pain and suffering and there's a lot of hurting and everybody's looking for that peace. And I must admit, in my time of trials, I've often asked God, how can a loving God allow this to happen to me? Why me? I'm a good person. I lead the teens. I have a good family and we go to church. And yet, God, you're allowing this awful, awful thing to disrupt my family or fill my body, or take away something I love. Why me? And if you're not saved and you're here tonight, and you've asked that question, and you've said, I'm just casting God away because a loving God wouldn't treat me this way. Let me ask you to reconsider, and this is why. Because as I mentioned before, when you call upon the Lord and accept God for who He is, the Creator of the world, and you accept His Son as the plan of redemption that will save you from your sin. And you realize that you're a sinner separated from a holy God. And you accept, you take that step of faith forward and you allow God to come into your heart. From that moment on, God starts to reveal things about his character that you never knew. And you start to see that perspective of a bigger picture and a plan for a divine plan of God in your life. Ways that he can use you, ways that he can raise you up, ways that he can sustain you 
and you can be encouraged by that. And your, your perspective begins to change immediately. And no longer are you saying, God, why me? I'm a good person. Instead you say, God, why me? Why do you love me? Because when I learn about God's character, I learn that he's all-knowing. And I know that he knows what's in my heart and in my mind. He knows the language I use. He knows the things I look at, the influences I allow in my life, the people I hang around with. And he knows that I live a life outside of church and a life inside of church, and those worlds never combine. Why me? Why do you love me, God? Jonah must have thought that. Jonah must have thought, in your face, you told me to do, th do something, and I said, no, see you later. God chased after him. Do you think Jonah said, why me? Why do you love me, God? What have I done to deserve your grace? You see, and when you start asking those questions, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you that I'm introducing you to a life of relief, eternal relief from your problems, from your hurt, from your pain, from your suffering. And let me be clear, and I'm done. As Pastor says, I pick up some things once in a while. When you become a Christian, I don't know a verse in the Bible that will say life gets easier. And there is no guarantee that you won't suffer with an awful disease or that you won't have everybody in your family die while you're still here on earth while you're a Christian. You may suffer, cry, hurt, and be in lots of pain until the day that you die. But non-Christian, that's as good as it gets for you. Because Christians, they have a life of eternal relief with no tears and no pain and no suffering. And that is the hope that God provides in His Son, Jesus Christ. And so tonight, Jesus has called you and God has called you to believe on Him as, his, as the Savior of your life and has called you to be a child of God. And you have a choice like Jonah to go or to say no. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord.